Hey. Hey, what's up? How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well. Uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm or, Zach, Gavin, by the way, just to introduce Gavin? I'm Zach. Zach, Gavin, nice to meet you. Thanks nice for hosting the podcast. Too. Of course, of course. Uh, so just to kick things off, could you tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, your campaign to uh, represent Brooklyn in the New York State Senate? Sure, sure, sure. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jabari Brisport. I'm a uh, 32-year-old public school teacher in Brooklyn, uh, born and raised. I teach in Crown Heights, and I am a candidate for state senate in the 25th Senate District. That's Central and West Brooklyn, and I um, think I am the leading candidate right now. We're up by around 4,000 votes, but we're waiting on about 27,000 mail-in ballots to be counted, so things could change, but we're feeling pretty confident. Gotcha. We actually had a very similar situation with... Um uh, Zohran Kwame Mandami is running for New York State Assembly, and he's also <laughs> waiting to hear back on the results of his election, I think, to this day. Uh, yeah, that's my so, buddy yeah. right there. <laughs> what was that? That's my buddy right there. I love Zohran. Yeah, yeah we love talking to him. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, what's that been like, just kind of waiting around to hear back the results? You say you're pretty optimistic? Yeah, I mean, it's been really frustrating. I mean, I think they were originally supposed to start counting them. July 1st, and then switched that to July 6th, and then became July 8th, and then they have a whole like breakdown where they do section by section. So they won't even get to our section, so I don't know when. So it <laughs> started, I think, tomorrow, hopefully by Tuesday, whatever tomorrow's date is. What's the day? 13th? So hopefully by the 14th, 14th they finally get, <laughs> they get to my race, mm -hmm. even though the election was about three weeks ago. But it's no, we feel good about it. I mean, you know, we can see a breakdown of where the ballots were returned from, which assembly districts and which sections, and, um, by, by, by and large, the majority of ballots are being returned from the areas that, that we won in a landslide. So we're, we're good, you know, unless, you know, unless people vote differently by mail um, drastically. But we're feeling pretty good and um, gearing up. You know, I, I cannot wait to be alongside Zoran in, in Albany. It's going to be great. Yeah, that'll definitely be uh, something special to behold. One of the things that we were really excited to talk to you about is uh, you have a you've thorough criminal justice reform um, section on your website. Uh, you've been really open about that. Uh, things like repealing the Law 50A, which excludes uh, New York's police officers from the freedom of information laws, um, prohibiting use of chemical weapons and other quote-unquote less lethal munitions uh, against um, citizens, allowing incarcerating citizens to participate in elections. Um, could mm -hmm. you just talk about your policies for how we can reform our cr criminal justice system, which obviously is in sweeping urgent need of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... So I'm going to say, like, you know, I guess two things that would be considered radical by a lot of people. And one, which is that I, I strongly believe we can free three out of four people easily and are in prison right now. And, you know, you know, people, certain people might freak out and say, oh, my God, you're just letting all these, these murderers and rapists out, whatever. And, you know, where we got that number from, this 75% reduction, because this was like a joint effort amongst all the socialists from uh, running, was that, you know, if we just turn back the clock on mass incarceration and went back to where we were like in the 1950s before the war on drugs started, we would see 75% fewer people in, in prison. So we need to walk back this, this notion that the way things are is the way they, things um, should be or the way they ought to be because the United States locks up so many people like by far, 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 far. And ways you do that are, you know, merely, you know, releasing Mostly people in prison and also just doing things that lead to less people getting into prison in the first place, you know, um, decriminalizing simple drug possession, you know, it's a victimless crime, uh, decriminalizing sex work, legalizing marijuana, um, getting rid of mandatory minimums, uh, pushing back on bail reform, you know, eliminating cash bail, because why do we have a, a, a dual justice system where you get treated differently if you have five dollars in your pocket versus if you have five million? So whatever we can do to um, reduce the number of people in um, prison and really think, start thinking more about what community safety looks like, because I, I, I'm of the opinion that you know, police don't make us safer. Um, I think they're a Band-Aid for holes in the social safety net. And I do believe it should be a net, something that catches you. Um, I think that's where restorative justice comes from, is making sure that everyone has a home, has housing, has healthcare, has a job, um, rather than just trying to patch these holes in our social safety net by you know, people with badges and guns. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that quote from Cornell West, where he says that uh, justice is what love looks like in public. And I think that your 
criminal justice reform policy really embodies that. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that we talked about that. And thank you for that. Another issue that's on your platform that I think is really cool. And I think it's awesome that you've put so much thought and, and honestly, honesty into it uh, is the animal rights aspect of your platform. <laughs> uh, it seems like politicians, even on the left, even on the far left, uh, they struggle to bring up this, you know, this dark reality of our industrial animal agriculture out of fear of, you know, offending people, or talking down to people, whatever. But uh, in my opinion, it's it's arguably one of the most, if not the most horrific aspects of our, you know, capitalist driven society. 29 billion mm -hmm. animals have been tortured and slaughtered for food this year in America alone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not only is this staggering because of the animal lives, but also because of the immense toll that cattle farming in particular has on climate change, mm -hmm. the vastly exploited, often undocumented workers that are forced to do mm -hmm. this really dangerous, unsanitary, traumatic job. And, th you know, this is not just some niche issue for tree huggers and, you know, Greenpeace activists to whine about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something that needs to be resolved if we're ever going to address climate change in a serious way and, and our mm -hmm. in, in the inequalities in society. Um, how do you plan on shifting the public on this issue as a state senator? I might need to hire you, Gavin, because you just like... <laughs> Describe the intersectionality better than I ever could. Um, no, that's it. I mean, there is just like, there is seriously so much interplay between animal agriculture and the environment and um, worker protection and also human health. Like there, a lot of people don't know this. There's just these massive, like, I don't know a, 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 a nice way to say it, but there's just these pig shit ponds um, <laughs> where, you know, they dump all the feces um, from their, their mastrosy pigs and then like it aerates into the air and wafts down into low income black communities in the South. And it's just literally poisoning them. Um, it's disgusting. It's, it's, it's just ter terrible. Um, but it's about bringing that up to light. Like, you know, you know, support for banning factory farms is much more widespread than politicians would have you believe. Like, you know, if you polled people, you would see a lot of people like by and large, um, would support, you know, getting rid of factory farms. Also, like, like you know, live wet markets too, especially now after COVID-19. Um, and really just bring up the health factor. I mean, animal rights is an issue where I think you need to appeal to people a little more on their own um, selfish side. Like, you know, I just, you know, letting people know that there is a human health factor too, just with animal agriculture and the way it poisons the environment, poisons literally being poor, poor um, people of color communities. Um, and also just unsafe for workers. There's so many undocumented workers um, working in just has extremely hazardous conditions, um, like very, very hazardous in some of these, in some of these, um, these slaughterhouses. And it's about bringing those to light. And, you know, there, there've been all these like, this is more federal level, but there's been all these ag gag bills about, you know, like keeping people from like bringing any sort of camera whatsoever into slaughterhouses because, you know, they, they know how, how, what, what happens when that's brought to light. So you really need more people with a, bu uh, um, a bully pulpit, like an elected official who can actually speak to these and say, this is not okay. Yeah, we've seen a really uh, draconian response in the court system, too, to protesters and people who have tried to stand up against recently. You know, I, I can't remember exactly where it was, but um, there was recently protesters that were charged with terrorism for uh, breaking in and doing a demonstration at, a, at a, a, some sort of plant recently. And it's like, you know, the, as the environmental movement grows and their demands become more urgent, I have a feeling that that's something that we're going to have to really uh, come up against. Yeah. yeah. Has, has people's responses right. just interesting? Uh, have, have people, you know, responded well to that platform or have you gotten some shit for that? Or I've gotten zero shit for that. I mean, everyone, people are excited about it, especially people that are really into animal rights yeah. or, um, you know, or vegans or animal rights, whatever. Um, people are really enthusiastic that like somebody's finally talking about it. It feels like, no, it feels like it's something that gets swept in the rug. Um, but it's deeply, deeply connected to so many issues and like, it's worth talking about. And it's also something that, you know, addressing animal rights issues, like is something that benefits everybody in my opinion. Um, and I don't know, I've only seen excitement about it. Uh, um, yeah. 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 I think you're right that there is more enthusiasm uh, from the public, even the people that uh, eat meat and don't plan to stop eating meat. You know, they don't necessarily want to be, eating their meat, knowing that it comes from there. They'd rather it be coming from more ethical sources. Mm -hmm. I think I can speak for a lot of uh, people in that sense. You know, I, I see, I, I'm a vegetarian too, but I, I all the time get people that are sympathetic to the cause of not eating meat, but that, that you know, they're not going to stop, but they they would definitely be sympathetic to a change of laws mm -hmm. or at least a radical uh, transformation in the way that, you know, these capitalist corporations have kind of taken over, mm -hmm. sucked all the, you know, any humanity that could be left in the animal, in agriculture industry out of it um mm -hmm. yeah so 
What was um, that? Yeah, no, and I think that, again, you know, the COVID-19, just to bring it back to that, uh, the yeah. way that we saw the meat processing plants, uh, you know, dr- being deemed essential workers, they weren't giving the, given the PPE that they, were need- that they mm-hmm. needed, they weren't given the pay, uh, yet they were, mm-hmm. you know, all, in some cases forced to return to work and, you know, incredibly unsafe conditions. They were lied to about their coworkers. So this is just, you know, uh, one of the many examples of the kind of horrors of the industry that we don't see. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about COVID-19. Um, obviously, you're running to represent Brooklyn, New York State, and New York City particularly, were uh, the ep- global um, epicenter as far as devastation um, for the virus. You've seen uh, nearly 10 times as many deaths as 9-11 in the state of New York alone. Um, you know, and not only that, the CARE Act provisions that were voted upon are set to expire. Um, what is the what is how is this affecting your community? What is it? What are people thinking? How are they feeling uh, looking at these prospects now? I, I read that 25 percent of people in New York City haven't been able to pay their rent since. Yeah. I mean, peop- yeah. Thank you, Zach. I mean, no, people are terrified. I mean, <laughs> I mean, one COVID-19 is terrifying, especially you're hearing now that people are catching the second time or, you know, it's like, it's like, what, what is this virus? Like, why, why is it so, why is it so baffling in the way it behaves? Um, so there's that, but also just in terms of their livelihoods, like people have been out of work for so long. Um, then they're worried about, okay, this, this, um, this lifeline they had is about to shrivel up and what do they do then? Um, people are terrified of evictions. Um, I was at a demonstration at a housing court, like we need to extend the cancel send a moratorium on evictions and truthfully just cancel rent because some people are backlogged now. They, they haven't, I mean, they've been out of work since March, haven't paid since March. It's like, there's not much they can do. Their hands are tied. Um, truthfully. 40% and of it, Americans before the virus didn't even have $400 in their savings account. How are they possibly supposed to dig themselves out of months and months of rent, which was almost half their paychecks to begin with in some cases, yeah. especially in New York. That's exactly it. But like, that's exactly it. And then you have like a, a state like New York that is so, um, so, so, hard hit where everyone knew someone who got sick if they weren't got sick didn't get sick themselves a lot of a lot of people know someone who died from the virus so in addition to just not having you know basic you know necessities like housing or like an income they also have like the lived trauma of having been seriously affected by this virus it's truly a horrific thing and we desperately need a bailout not just from the federal level but also the state level we need a bailout for individual citizens but also for um small businesses um we desperately need something that's going to keep and keep our communities whole once this once we get through um this this um awful pandemic yeah um another thing you've spoken eloquently and a lot about is the rapid the rapid gentrification in your community in new york city uh-huh. and how it's affected you the students you've taught at, at public school you teach at Um, And this is one of those unique issues that's often kind of pinned on politicians or legislative bodies for allowing it to happen. But, you know, arguably, it's it's really just our corporate friendly capitalist economy that makes it kind of inevitable here in Kansas City. We're seeing and all around the metro area, we're seeing these kind of cheap, hastily constructed apartments, buildings go up all over town that are still charging exorbitant prices, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's no competition to buy up the spaces because of COVID. So they're getting away with it even more. Um, can you just speak a little bit more about to these issues and and how we if if we have a chance of stopping this rapid corporatized gentrification of our communities? Yeah, I like that you know you frame it as being corporatized because that that's what it is. I mean, like there's no there's no way around it in terms of there's no like ways you can shuffle around this tax credit here, this tax payment here. Like ultimately, we have an issue where we are trying to have housing both be um, an investment and also something that's affordable, and that's just like that's an impossible contradiction to overcome there, there is nothing in this world that could be something that both makes you money and that is affordable you know it's I, we have to we have to come to a decision as a society of whether or not we want a, um, a home and a roof over your head to be something that's a guaranteed human right or is it gonna be something that you invest in and make you money but it's not gonna be both and we've been trying to make it both and failing for um, since, since the housing market has existed um i think we need to you know decommodify housing ultimately bring it out of the profit hands it you know i I think it's fine to own you know, a roof over your head as much as you own, like, you know, a shirt on your back or like the food that you're about to eat, but it should not be something that you, um, you, you invest in. That's something that appreciates and in value that at faster the pace of inflation that you can resell for a quick profit. Like that's not going to work because people are taking advantage of that. They're corporatizing it and it's leading to the situation we have now where we, we have more empty houses than we have homeless people because it's been so 
so commodified. It's just, it's truly ridiculous. So i um, deeply investing in public social housing. I like, I like community land trusts as well. I think that's a great way to have communal ownership of um, a home and ultimately just decommodifying, like taking away all the incentives for housing and homes to be a thing that makes you rich. Definitely. Oh, I had a question for you about um, public schools. I think it, it was either earlier today or late last night, uh, Governor Newsom in California announced that uh, students in California would not be returning physically to schools um, in August when they began enrollment, uh, or in, not enrollment, but like began teaching again. I'm not exactly sure how you would worry for elementary school students, but you're a teacher yourself. And I was wondering, what do you, how would you like to see the federal government teach students in the time of the COVID crisis? Obviously, we want to, you know, keep safety as the highest order, but I just can't help but think about all the inequalities that take place when you have students that are relying on learning in their home environment. Um, you know, not only are we thinking about access yeah. to food, but access to internet, access to a stable environment where children can focus. Yeah. Uh, especially in the city where real estate is so hard to come by. I mean, a square foot is so expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me just, thank you for asking that. Let me just start by ask, like, by saying like, you know, I do think like, first things first, we got to make sure people aren't at, at risk of, of the virus. So I, I, I'm, I'm in the camp of saying we've got people home in the fall too. Like, I don't see any way that, <laughs> I mean, you used to see, I'm not, you said y'all in Kansas City, both of you or? Yeah, both of us. Yeah. Okay. So in New York City, they released these models, um, like various competing models for how they're going to do it, but it's all, everything is a hybrid. There is no model that says everybody stays home or everybody comes back. Everything is like, Here's a model if you can have half of your students in your school, and here's another model if you can have a third of your students in your school at one time. And they all involve like rotating in and out, but it's just, you know, if, if one teacher gets sick and then you, it just, this virus is too deadly and it's, too un, it's still too unknown for us to do anything. I mean, it is frustrating because, you know, you do have this digital divide and like in New York City, at, at least, you know, what the, the Department of Education was able to do was to start shipping out um, iPads um, to students that didn't have one. But that brings up the another question of, well, how do, what do you connect the iPad to? You know, we have students that don't have internet access and um, that's a problem. Um, I think it is time, if you bring up the federal government, let's start pushing for a broadband for all, like let's start treating internet access as a 21st century right in the same way that we try to make, you know, we, we ensure to, we fight to make sure everyone has access to electricity and clean water, like give everyone access to the internet um, so we can ensure that our students are learning. And then also really that, you know, going back to the housing thing we were talking about, ensuring that everyone actually does um, have a house. I mean, you know, I don't know what the stats are like in, in Kansas City, but in, in New York, like one in 10 public school students is homeless or housing unstable. So, you know, if you don't even have a home to go to, um, you're going to have that instability and that lack of, um, I don't know, that lack of ability to like learn. I, I've heard you know, some of my students, like in the past several months, you know, when they unmute to answer a question, I can hear all the chaos in the background and, and it breaks my heart because like they are trying so, so hard to learn while there is just chaos surrounding them in their home. And it's, and it's like nobody's fault. It's, like, it's not that they have bad parents. It's just like everyone is, you know, stuck inside one little room or one little apartment where there's not enough room for everyone. And that's, you know, that's a failure of our housing system to give everyone the space they need. Absolutely. Have you heard anything like from your colleagues or anything? Do you think that it is going to be mostly online in New York City or are you still have no idea? There's pushback. I would like it to be. I mean, yeah, the, the models that came out, they came from wait, what was it? either the chancellor or the mayor. I'm actually blanking right now. But like there has been a lot of pushback already from teachers and parents that are like, this is not going to work. <laughs> you know, Because one, one, the teachers are there full time. It's like the models are like how we just shuffle around the students, whether or not you have half the students there or a third at a time. But like the teachers are there the whole time. And um, what they don't get paid enough to be put themselves at risk constantly either. Yeah, right. And it's just like, and you know, a significant number of like I, I'm a I'm a young, able-bodied, you know, wh whatever. But like a significant number of teachers, <laughs> they're over fifty. Like they're they're high, they're at risk. It's and it's it's really it's it's very dangerous to say you know they're going to be in there. Um, you know, rotating amongst hundreds of uh, students, you know, that's, ex it's, that's so, ex that's exposure. Um, and I, I can only imagine, especially as we get into the fall and like when, you know, things start compacting with flu season, like, you know, I, you, they were just like test, you know, I think there was, they were pulling around New Yorkers of whether or not New Yorkers think, you know, we've actually hit the worst of it. And most of us were like, no, <laughs> because we, we, you know, we've all seen COVID. Sorry, Zach, you're about to say something? Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't... Oh yeah. No, it's just like, you know, I'm like most, most, you know, we all experience COVID in like the spring and summer months, you know, um, when flu season already passed, but like when it's compounded by flu season, that's going to be really, really um, terrible. 
And no, we definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm in the camp of keeping students at home. And like, I know it's, it's, it's really not the same. I, I don't like teaching um, at, at, um, from via Zoom as much as in person. Uh, I just know that there are students that are slipping through the cracks. I, I can't check in on my students the way I would like to um, when they're doing their work. Uh, the students that were struggling are struggling even more now because I'm not there to help hold their hands um, and, and, and check their work and do all that. Uh, so it's really, really frustrating. But, you know, at the end of the day, we got to, like, contain this virus. And um, it's this is a once-in-a-century event. So we have to, you know, use solutions that seem very out there because this is this has never happened before. We need to act like that in our solutions. Well, Jabari, we had uh, one more question for you before we yeah. let you go. And uh, you've been endorsed by a lot of uh, the most important big names in the progressive movement, people like uh, Bernie Sanders, AOC. And in my opinion, um, endorsing and helping down ballot progressives that are trying to make a big difference in local areas, people like yourself, uh, endorsing people like yourself is probably perhaps the most meaningful way that, you know, Bernie and the squad can actually make a difference right now since Congress is totally controlled by corporate Democrats and Republicans that honestly aren't going to budge an inch on the squad or, or Bernie's actual priorities, which is something we saw repeatedly. Uh, with the various iterations of the COVID legislation. Um, did receiving those endorsements, did they really make a big difference in your campaign and with your fundraising and everything? Uh, he, oh, we got a huge boost in fundraising and, and, and press after that. Um, yeah, especially with Bernie Sanders helping out push for that uh, surge in small dollar donations. And it truly is so important. Like a lot of people like write off local elections, but like truthfully, like as we saw during COVID, like if, if you're upset about, you know, a lot of the response to your in, in your state to COVID, that's that's predominantly your state legislature and your and your governor. That were, I mean, this was a very state led thing. There was some there was some federal stimulus here and there, but predominantly it was a state by state response to how you dealt with. And we can see that during COVID. And if that's state level, and if you've been like pissed off at the police and following the defund police movement, that's your city council or your border board of aldermen or whatever legislative you have in your city um, or town. That's where the budget for the police comes from. So like a lot of these really important things are run at the local level and it's definitely important to get plugged into them. Uh, just to kind of expand on that really quick and follow up, uh, you mentioned the uh, state responsibility, which um, is evident, but it's kind of in direct contrast to the way that the media has portrayed your state. Um, you know, Andrew Cuomo has been like showered with praise from his brother uh, 24 seven on CNN as thousands of people died. Uh, he even, you know, I mean, and if you go back to when they were still praising him, he was saying, we're not going to shut down New York City. Bill de Blasio doesn't have the authority. And Bill de Blasio was behind. So just this kind of like uh, heroism that they're trying to, you know, calls for him to run for president. Is that, you know, just kind of like, uh, is, is, that, is that something that you see actually in New York, are New Yorkers feeling that same sentiment? Has the propaganda, you know, seeped through or? Yeah, I mean, well, yes and no. I mean, some of us can see through it. Um, Cuomo's propaganda works really well. He's very popular in many parts of Brooklyn and, and New York State. Um, you know, he does one re-election, you know, a few times. And it is really unfortunate because if any other governor had <laughs> by far the number of deaths, uh, the highest number of deaths uh, from COVID-19, they would be lacerated in the media for the worst response ever. But, I, you know, Cuomo is a marketing genius. He's very Machiavellian in the way he handles things and is very good at um, punishing people that, uh, that cross him. Um, so that's really unfortunate. I, I hope he does not run for president. <laughs> I would not like to see that uh, uh, happen. But, um, you know, he literally got away by just being better than Trump. Like, you know, he was very consistent. So I'll give him that. I'll give, I'll give him a point. I'll give Andrew Cuomo at one point, which is like, was very consistent at 11 a.m. every single he came on and he gave updates. And when everyone was like, ah, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm terrified. Like, it was nice to have someone to come on 11 a.m. every single morning and give updates. And I think that was very reassuring for a lot of people. Um, we had the worst. That just illustrates the vacuum, the lack of leadership in this country. I mean, we have the, our leading. Our, I mean, Joe Biden yeah. is up by nine points. Hillary Clinton was up at two points. Uh, if you looked at RCP at this time in 2016, Joe Biden's about four times that. You know, it, it's so ridiculous, yeah. and it's, he has he's nowhere to be found. He's not campaigning. He's not making yeah. speeches. He's you know, it's ridiculous, and uh, I don't know. No, you're right. Is the vacuum leadership? Because I'm giving a very low bar. He showed up at 11 a.m. and gave updates. And that, was, and that was, and that was enough for some people. <laughs> we had, like you said, a back in the leadership. At least he didn't start fighting with the reporters and stuff. I guess that's. <laughs> the mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks so um, much for joining us today, Jabari. Really? Yeah, where can people go to support you? Uh, you know, go to my my website. Still up. It is Jabari for statesenate.com. Sign up, get updates, and um, 
I'll let you know if we won when we <laughs> know if we won. Or not. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, we wish you the best of luck and uh, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Evan.